he sees the police chief's car in front of the president. Then he sees uh, the president. In front, between Oswald and JFK, is the windshield of the car, a metal bar that goes over the center of the car. It almost looks like a roll bar. It's not. It's for the president to stand up when it's a convertible and to attach part of the roof on. Then there's Governor Conley sitting in front of the president. Then there's JFK. And all eyes in the cars driving towards the book depository are looking at the book depository. So if Oswald leans out the window to open fire, people are going to see that motion. They're going to see the rifle. He could not have gotten off more than one shot, I think, before someone in the motorcade reacted, either the driver speeding up the car, one of the Secret Service men opening fire with a rifle at Oswald in the window, and Oswald would have had to, to achieve an Olympic-type marksman shot to miss the windshield, miss the metal bar, miss the governor, and hit JFK in the forehead. It would have been a very, very tight shot. Whereas once the car comes and makes the turn, and Oswald's watching the car go away from him, it creates the optical illusion of a stationary object slowly getting smaller. Because the car is not moving right to left from Oswald's point of view at that moment, it's driving away from him in a line. And that gives him the chance to fire what he fired, which is three shots. He even reloaded to take the fourth shot, but he decided not to take it. So Oswald had more time to fire multiple shots and less chance of being observed than if he fired at a car driving directly at him when all the occupants are looking up and in his direction. It's a lot easier when you walk into the box and just put the gun right behind his head. <laughs> yes. Well, yes. Let's talk about that building uh, for a moment. It became a shrine immediately, did it not? And uh, people did not want to see a theater open up again in that. Now, James and I, for our book, uh, Linga's Assassins, we wanted to get a photograph from the box at the perspective that Lincoln was at so we could see what his last moment, what he was looking at the last moment. Whoa, no, this is a holy place. It's a shrine. You cannot do that. Well, the place had been gutted, for heaven's sakes. Nothing inside it. It's all recreation by Disney, frankly. It's well done, mm -hmm. but it's not a holy moment. You're in a holy area, perhaps. Mm -hmm. So, but what happened to the building itself and uh, a quick brief uh, history of it. It's staff. funny you're saying the perspective of the box because when Agnew was vice president, he wanted he was insisting that he be allowed to sit in that box at, for the ceremonies reopening Fords. Uh, and Frankie Hewitt, bless her heart, said to his Secret Service agents, "You know, the last guy who sat in that box, it didn't turn out too well for him." <laughs> but uh, certainly, one of the oddest coincidences is the collapse of Ford's theater mm -hmm. uh, at, at the, the same day as, as Edwin Booth's funeral in 1893 when it collapses and 27 government clerks are killed uh, because of the, the shoring, the underpinning of the foundation, uh, the work for the restoration having been done by Stanton's brother-in-law. Uh, Gifford, the state's carpenter who had built it originally, washed his hands of that whole operation. But uh, it, it, the long fight with Stanton was a determination to his death that that would never again be used as a theater. Um, and John Ford's argument, quite logically, was it's costing me tens of thousands of dollars every month to not be allowed to reopen as a theater. And certainly uh, the, the pitchfork and torch brigade took over when the religious community stormed against the theater that was not going to reopen because of the holy shrine of the nature of it. And, and really, it is not until 1969 that it reopens for theatrical purposes. And, and they've done a beautiful job in restoring it. It's, it's just a wonderful place. If, you're, if anyone's ever in Washington, it, it has to be a visit there. And the, the beautiful new educational center across the street is just wonderful. There's a, a, a stack in the, the foyer of all of the books written about Lincoln. And it goes up for three stories, uh, so many of them that have been written. It's just, it's just a wonderful place. The um, The building though today is beautiful except in the, maybe with on the Ford's uh, foundation you're not going to be happy about this but Go ahead. I'm kind of uh, <laughs> wondering what you feel about the museum in the bottom it used to be very site specific and now it's all the door and the photographs and the boot and everything are 
But Sibley I'll Museum is doing that today. The, the, the redo so of the Smithsonian American History see. Museum is moving that same direction. We forget from from our generation the appeal, the visual appeal that needs to be there for a younger generation to make history accessible to them. And I, I think the nature of museum displays is changing to, to appeal to a younger, wider audience. And there's another reason why we did what we did at Ford's Theater also. There is no Abraham Lincoln Museum in Washington, D.C. Millions of people come there a year in, in, in search of the Lincoln story. And prior uh, to our new renovation of the, of the museum in the basement, you're right, Dan, the basement museum at Ford's was very assassination specific. And we made a decision that we had to be in part not just the Museum of Assassination, but a Lincoln Museum that would tell Lincoln's story from his arrival in Washington. We include the murder plot against him in Baltimore, which was a real plot. You know, we've got a replica of the train car that Lincoln arrived in. We have relics from the plotters against him. And so we tell the story of Lincoln arriving in Civil War Washington and what his experiences were, what he found, what he did. So it tells more of the Lincoln and Washington story than the former museum did. And, and so uh, some people miss that the museum was only about the assassination, but we felt because the American people have no place to go in Washington uh, to learn the entire Lincoln story, we wanted to tell a broader story, but still focus very much on the assassination too. All the relics are still there. We brought more out of storage. And, and so we hope now that, that our museum satisfies those who want to study the assassination, but also the broader context of Abraham Lincoln's life in Washington, D.C. And during his presidency. If I'm not mistaken, tourism figures have really come up since that renovation. Yes, they well, have. Sure. Yeah. They have. Yeah. And, of course, we're, we're having our ultra commemoration at Ford's Theater mm -hmm. on April 14th and 15th, 2015. Believe me, I know what we have planned. I can't reveal it all. But you want to be in Washington, D.C. in April 2015 for the way Ford's Theater is going to commemorate Abraham Lincoln. But hold on to your head. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you this. Uh, I asked others this and uh, get your thought. Um, JFK's legacy. Um, I mean, that's a broad thing, and how do we get to that? And uh, people like Robert and Jackie certainly... Uh, are trying to give try to give a certain legacy to it, just like Billy Herndon did for Lincoln, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but I think of Garfield, who was shot. He was a Kennedy-esque type person, really. He was handsome. He was intelligent, uh, a war hero. Loved the uh, theater. Loved the theater, political. But after the last person who read a newspaper about Garfield dying died, the emotion all just went out. And I wonder if, after all of us who lived through Camelot and have that still within us, we're gone, does the emotion fade enough that his legacy, in a way, will fade? I don't think the JFK legacy will fade for a couple of reasons. First of all, what is the legacy? Uh, I don't know. Certainly something went wrong in America when John Kennedy died. Uh, he had such optimism. He was a, an American patriot who believed with every fiber of his being in American exceptionalism and American greatness. And he believed that America had a special role in the world. And one of his greatest strengths was his ability to inspire others to believe that and to embrace that. He believed that Americans could do anything if they put their minds to it, could achieve anything. And we lost a lot of that confidence with his death. There became a paranoia about government, about institutions. Who knows? If JFK had lived, what would have happened in Vietnam? He had sent 20,000 men. And Robert said in an oral interview for the Kennedy Library, my brother would not have pulled out. He would have wanted to win. Others say he would have pulled out. Would we have had the assassinations of Martin Luther King, of Robert Kennedy? Would cities have burned down? Would the age of Aquarius have come? JFK was not a 1960s hipster. You can divide the 60s from 19, pre-63 and post-63. He was a cold warrior. <laughs> he was a cold warrior. The 60s of the summer of love, would that have even happened? Manson, Helter Skelter, would all these terrible things of the 1960s have happened? We'll never know. But I think we're always going to be interested in JFK because too many teenage girls have come to me at public events and told me about their fascination with Jackie Kennedy. Well, too, too many men in their 20s who don't remember it. JFK was on film and in color. We don't know the people who knew the people who knew the people who once knew Abraham Lincoln. We, we can still know people who knew the Kennedys, and JFK is forever frozen at age 46, 
in color film, sound recording, millions of photographs. Uh, he can seem alive to us today. And I see that new generations have expressed an interest in JFK. And in our world, Dan, of rare books and manuscripts and artifacts, you know, we're obsessive collectors of these things. Some of the JFK rarities are now approaching the values and, and financial desirability of Lincoln items. I hate to say it, but I think in terms of our collector world and artifact world, JFK is becoming the new Abraham Lincoln. At least not. We'll have, we'll have to see what happens. <laughs> we don't, I don't know. Uh, you know, I don't know. I remember when Jackie's uh, material came up at yes. auction, and, and I was here and watching on a screen for uh, Sotheby's, and yes. uh, others were in other L.A. and New York, and they're all watching on screen. Some were there live, and my God, the prices were unbelievable. Yes. I know, right? The week after the, after that, numbers of people are coming back and saying, no, I don't want to pay those prices. Well, from the trends I'm seeing now, you might have to consider changing the name of the shop to the <laughs> John F. Kennedy book shop. It may be Millard Fillmore first. <laughs> well, what can I say? There's so much in each of these books that actually, and, and also for the younger readers too, I think they'll get a lot out of this as well. Um, that they're both the same way. You're going to feel like you're there. You're going to feel that you are a participant almost. And that's what is great about both these books. I really felt myself involved in who was there and in a second by second uh, event for both of you doing that. We couldn't do everything today. Um, certainly I wanted to touch on Jackie and there was certainly a difference in how Jackie treated LBJ versus how Mary Lincoln was with uh, anyone. <laughs> Andrew Johnson. You know, she stayed in the White House for six weeks. I have a letter right now from that period, the first one I've ever had, uh, from that six-week period until Andy Johnson pushed her out. Uh, Jackie did it as a two weeks. She was out weeks. on her own she volition. She was out. Uh, we didn't really talk about artifacts because you talk about numbers of artifacts in here, where they are, how they're being used. Uh, I once had a um, Denitas spoon uh, for that had in the bowl the hanging scene of the 36 Sioux Indians that in 19, 1862 were hanged all together in a square. There it was in a Denitas spoon. I go, oh, terrible. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have in your book a Dealey Plaza pen holding desk set, which is with an open window, yes. which is kind of interesting, but many other artic uh, artifacts in there as well. Uh, in a footnote in page 262, you'll get a chance to see what those artifacts are. And of course, many interesting characters are in there that we didn't cover. Arnold Rowland is one that could have changed history, perhaps, uh, but didn't. We didn't go into really the trial, uh, Tom, for yours and a little bit more on Ford's theater. There were so many characters we haven't gotten to. You know, Laura Keene and what happened to her, what happened to the, really all of them. Really tragic. Really Hers tragic. is one of the saddest stories well, after Spangler, the After Spangler, maybe. Uh, but that's certainly one of them. And uh, how the theater changed, fascinating how stock companies were changing uh, in your book after, uh, Edwin, you were saying, how realism was coming in, the stock item uh, companies were going down. And that really impacted how uh, they played or didn't play Couldn't afterwards the in theater. The door to the box, you know, who bore that hole? There's conflicting evidence there, and that's in the book. You're going to have to read the book. Uh, <laughs> and others in there as well. Uh, one thing I've been thinking about, the intermission song. Who went up? Who was sent up to tell the Lincolns well, about the intermission uh, song? H.B. Phillips had written the words for it as a poem, Honor to yeah. Our Soldiers, and Withers had set it to music. Mm. And originally it was to have been sung in intermission, but uh, they kept postponing it, and then Laura Keene said, well, let's send for my piano and have that here. Let's have the whole company sing it. And Withers was getting angrier and angrier, and right before the actual shot, he had come up on stage to remonstrate with Wright, the stage manager, why wasn't my song? song being sung yet and yet it it wasn't sung for many years after that because mm -hmm. it was to, to have been finally performed after the show and we didn't talk about uh, Buckingham uh, the well here's an artifact for you uh, Diot 
you you mentioned Die out in here. He had one of the original playbills. Oh, so he's, and he kept it, and he thought a baby <laughs> maybe from Lincoln's hand, mm -hmm. probably not. But nonetheless, he had one of the originals that he kept. He thought it was worth over a hundred dollars. After it was gone, it sold for four dollars and nineteen cents or something like this. So, who knows about Kennedy either? Uh, the characters in Tom's book, William Ferguson, the barkeep, John Miles. James Ferguson, the barkeep. Uh, James. William Ferguson. I'm sorry, that's right. James cowboy. Ferguson, sorry. Uh, Spangler, of course. And Maddox, Matthews, we've touched on. Ritter's book. You know, there's one that's an interesting uh, story in here that you might want to read about, perhaps, as you said, Baker and others putting in a spy. He'd only been there a few weeks. Again, you'll have to read this. So. I want to thank both of you for being here and your publishers for bringing Regnery House and Morrow for bringing the two of you here uh, for this wonderful discussion. Thank all of you for taking time out of the day to be here as well. Of course, you watching live uh, as well. I want to thank the staff of Abraham Lincoln Bookshop. Uh, we couldn't do this without all of you, and thank you. Be back on Thursday evening. Hope we'll see you. Bye. Thanks. Thanks.